الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله على الناس هج البيت من استطاع إليه السبيل سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم So in the previous lecture we covered some details concerning the ihram um, entering into the haram and uh, visiting and seeing the Kaaba for the first time and different du'as that you should make So now we're going to begin the le- the lecture on umrah All right when a person enters into the haram they're going to have one of several different intentions obviously for us who are coming from so far away we always have the same intention either we're going to have an intention for umrah or we're going to have an intention for hajj so if you have an intention for umrah then you're going to perform the deeds that i am outlining exactly in the order that i outline them if you have an intention for hajj then you have to ask yourself another question which hajj now remember i told you there are three types of hajj the first is called hajj qiran which means that you do an umrah and you do a hajj in the same ihram the second is called hajj tamattu in Hajj Tamattu, you do an Umrah, you shave your head, you take off the Ahram, and you put on a new Ahram in order to do Hajj. And then the third one was Hajj Ifrad. In Hajj Ifrad, you do only a Hajj, you do not do an Umrah. So this discussion that we're going to have now concerning the Umrah applies to if you're doing the Umrah alone, if you're doing Hajj Kiran, or if you're doing Hajj Tamattu. The only time you don't have to worry about Umrah is when you're doing Hajj Ifrad, which is only the Hajj by itself. So that's the first uh, introductory point that we need to remember. Now, Umrah in general is Sunnah Mu'akkadah to perform once in your lifetime. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed this in the seventh year. Remember that in the sixth year, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tried to perform it with his companions. The uh, Quraysh did not let the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into Mecca, Mukarrama um, at that time. They prohibited him and they had to sign a treaty of at Hudaybiyah. And in that treaty, they agreed that the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu could come the next year. And so that was the seventh year. And in the seventh year, the Quraysh emptied out the city and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his companions performed an Umrah. So this was the Umrah performed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so it's Sunnah Mu'akkadah to perform Umrah once in your lifetime. May Allah give us a tawfiq to be able to go and do that. Now it's also part of the Hajj. I told you that when the Prophet ﷺ went for his Hajj, he performed the Hajj Qiran. When he went from Medina for his Hajj in the final year of his life, he performed a Hajj Qiran. So what does that mean? It means that he put on the Ahram, he entered into the Haram, he performed the Umrah, he remained in Ahram, and then he went and performed the rites of Hajj. So when you go for Hajj, for the most part, when an American a uh, person goes for Hajj, they usually perform either Hajj Tamattu or Hajj Qiran. This is pretty much the two options that you have. Now, there are some important things associated with performing Umrah. Number one, the Prophet wasallam said in a hadith that an Umrah expiates the sim- sins between another Umrah. So for example, you perform an Umrah now, five years later you perform another Umrah, all the minor sins in between those two Umrahs are wiped out by the second Umrah. Another thing, especially in the month of Ramadan, is that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Umrah in Ramadan equals the reward of Hajj. And in another hadith, which is a beautiful hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that if you perform Umrah in Ramadan, it's as if you get the reward of performing Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. So you can imagine what a great act of virtue it is to be able to perform Umrah in this blessed month. And that's why... Perhaps the other time when the haram is so crowded, so crowded that it becomes difficult to even uh, get inside the haram is actually in Ramadan. The two big times when there's just enormous crowd is either in the month of Ramadan or at the time of Hajj. Okay, now when we say that you have to perform Umrah, Umrah basically is the is the term that refers to four major acts. So anybody who's going to perform Umrah has to perform four acts. Number one, they have to perform tawaf with the niyyah. And that is a mandatory act for the, um, for the umrah. 
Now, what is tawaf? Tawaf means to walk around the Kaaba seven times. So that's tawaf. The second thing that they have to do once they complete the tawaf is they have to perform salah at Maqam Ibrahim. Maqam Ibrahim, I'm going to show you a picture of later. It's a spot that marks the footprints of Ibrahim alayhi salam and it's a special stone that Ibrahim alayhi salam used to rebuild the Kaaba prior to the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Some ulama state that that was a stone that he stepped on and it had a very unique ability to rise and fall as he was rebuilding the Kaaba, it provided him sort of with escalation in order to be able to reconstruct the Kaaba. Anyway, that's a very blessed place. Um, in fact, it comes in the Quran, وَفِيهِ آيَاتٌ What's the ayah? Huh? فِيهِ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ مَقَامُ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ So, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually refers to the fact that in that in this masjid, in this area, are very many blessed places one of which is Maqam Ibrahim. So we have to, after we finish the tawaf, we have to perform salah at Maqam Ibrahim, which is basically a two rakah of salah. After that, we go and perform something called sa'i. Sa'i means to walk between Safa and Marwa. These are two mountains that are also attached to the masjid. And we go between those mountains seven times. So we go from Safa to Marwa, back to Safa, that counts as two. So each trip to each mountain counts as one circuit. And so you make seven different trips back and forth. Finally, after the sa'i, you have to either trim your hair or you have to shave your hair. These four acts constitute the umrah and they're done in the state of ihram. So this is what refers to the umrah. All right, now remember, depending on your situation, you're going to have to obviously be in a state of ihram in order to do the umrah. And so we talked about the ihram in the last lecture. I'm not going to... Um, talk about it again, you, you pretty much should be able to recall those points that we mentioned previously. All right, so what are you going to do before you perform Umrah? You're going to enter the Haram. You're going to get yourself settled. Then you're going to go enter the Masjid. You're going to make Dua when you first see the Kaaba. And all these things were described in our previous lecture. The next thing you're going to do is wait for the right time. Now, what do I mean by wait for the right time? If there's a fuddled prayer going on, or if you're performing your sunnah for some fuddled prayer, or there's a janazah prayer going on, you're going to hold back a little bit. If you walk into the masjid and you know that the fuddled prayer, let's say, for dhuhr is about to start in 10 minutes, don't start the umrah. It's going to confuse you. You really want to have a little bit of a window to perform it. It takes about an hour and a half to two hours to do these acts. So you want to find a good window. So, you know, look at the time, try to figure out when the, when the next prayer is, and try to give yourself some window to do it if you have to wait a little bit, wait a little bit to get the proper time. So that's the first thing you're going to do. Now, once you decide that it's the right time to perform Umrah and it looks like you're going to, you're going to have a little bit of a, a little bit of a window to do the deeds, you go ahead and you do the Tawaf. That's the very first act. Okay, what does Tawaf mean? Tawaf means to circle around something. That's what it literally means. But in the Sharia, it means to circle around the Kaaba seven times with the intention that I am doing tawaf of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the legal definition. The spiritual definition is that it's the lover circling the home of the beloved, asking that he accept him. That's basically the spiritual definition of tawaf. Basically, a person is madly in love, they left their clothes, they left their home, they left their family, they left their comfort, and now they're just walking around, circling the house of Allah, begging that he bestow his mercy upon them. That's the spiritual definition of tawaf. Now, the tawaf is actually a very significant deed because it highlights the Kaaba itself, which is sort of the home of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this planet. Besides the other home is the heart of the mu'min, but this is the sort of the defined home. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Qur'an, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ بَيْتٍ وُلِعَ لِلنَّاسِ لَلَّذِي بِبَكَّةَ مُبَارَكًا وَهُدًا للعالمين. That the very first house established for people on the planet, meaning the first house of worship, was the Kaaba. So this ayah refers to the Kaaba. Now, if you go back historically, there's some difference of opinion. Some ulama believe, based on hadith, that actually the Kaaba was built by the angels. And then it was discovered by Adam alayhi salam. And then during the flood, it was taken up. You know, the flood of, uh, d during the time when the, the flood of Nuh alayhi salam. And then subsequently, Ibrahim alayhi salam 
uh, rebuilt the Kaaba, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the one who repopulated it by bringing the Deen back to life. And now, obviously, we are the ones that perform the Hajj and the Umrah regularly. Other ulama, based on their understanding, believe that it was built by Adam alayhi salam. Irrespective, it was definitely the very first house of worship on the planet. Now, actually, some commentators believe, based on some hadith, that what happened was that the whole earth was covered with water before even the earth was created. There was just a big, vast body of water. And then there was a little bubble that came up from that water, and that little bubble was actually the Kaaba. And then that bubble spread across the horizon, and then that formed the ground that we now walk upon. So they believe the Kaaba was actually the first uh, formation of land in the creation of the planet Earth. Irrespective, there's no doubt amongst our scholars that this is a very, very uh, sacred place and that this represents the home of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in one way and that this is why we circle the house during the Umrah. Okay, so we talked about the history. The key thing to remember is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed our community with the ability to go and visit the Kaaba and the abil ability to circle it and it's something to be thankful for. In fact, the Kaaba also has very many merits. If you look through hadith, you find the Prophet ﷺ mentioned some. For example, Abdullah ibn Abbas narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said that every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down 120 portions of mercy on the Baytullah, on the Kaaba itself. Then the Prophet ﷺ explicated these. 60 are for those people who are engaged in tawaf. So as people are engaged in tawaf, they're being showered with the mercy of Allah. 40 are for those people who are praying in the direction of the Qibla in the direction of the Kaaba. And 20 are those people who just, for those people who just sit and look at the Kaaba. So Ajib, that this house is so blessed, that even if you just sit back and look at it, you actually receive blessing. So it's a very, very sacred place. Alright, now when you want to begin Tawaf, you have to actually first locate the starting point for the Tawaf. Now before you do that, you have to remember you must be in a state of wudu. You cannot perform the tawaf without being in a state of wudu. It's wajib to have a state of wudu. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to locate the black stone. Hajr al-Aswad. That's what it's called in Arabic. In English it translates as the black stone. The black stone is a very famous stone that was revealed from the heavens. When the stone was revealed, it came down as white. In fact, in hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says when the stone first came down, that that stone was completely white like milk. <laughs> And as people began to touch that stone, it would suck up their darkness and their evil. And so it became black over time by people touching it. So that's why it's now called the black stone. It happens to sit in one of the corners of the Kaaba. And it'll become very evident when I show you this picture. And that's going to be the starting point for the Tawaf. Now, if you go to this picture, you'll see that in this corner here, you can see it's labeled Hajr al-Aswad. That is the black stone. So that's one particular corner of the Kaaba, and it's at that corner of the Kaaba that you're going to begin your tawaf. Now that's marked by two different ways. Number one, if you're having difficulty finding it, you can just look up and look at the different minarets of the masjid. Every set of minarets is in pairs. You'll see two minarets, two minarets, two minarets. In one corner, you'll see only one minaret. In that Opposite that corner is where the black stone is. Okay, so that's one way you're going to locate it. The other way is that if you're sitting on the matawf itself, the matawf is the area, this this area, see the bottom where it says matawf, place of tawaf? If you're sitting on the matawf itself and people are circling the Kaaba, if you turn your head away from the Kaaba and to this side, you'll see that there's a big green light against the wall. And that green light is opposite the black stone. So these are the two ways by which you're going to locate the black stone. Now when you locate the black stone, what you're going to do is, so this is the black stone here. You're going to put yourself a few steps before the black stone. Now the direction of the off is this way. You're going to circle this way. So you're going to just move a few steps behind the black stone. and at, Meaning, you know, oh, before the black stone. So imagine that the black stone, let's say, let's put it this way. This is a black stone. Imagine that there's a black line that forms on the ground where the black stone is. There used to be a line actually, a brown line, but they took away that brown line. So that's not there anymore. But just imagine that there is a line on the floor 
you're going to move before the black line. You're going to move behind the black line. Now, when you move behind the black line, you want to make sure that the entire stone, if you're facing the Kaaba, the entire stone should be on your right-hand side. That's how you know that you're standing in the right place. So you're going to move a few steps to the right at, when you're facing the Kaaba, okay, but not so far away. You're not going to move way against the wall over there, just a few steps before. And then what you're going to do is you're going to make something called ittiba. Ittiba is something that males do, and it refers to exposing the right arm with the ihram. So normally you're wearing the ihram like a cape. Now what you're going to do is you're going to tuck the ihram underneath your arm such that your right arm is completely exposed. And only men are going to do this, obviously. Okay? And you only do this when the tawaf is going to be followed by a sa'i. Meaning, you know that you're going to make tawaf, and after the tawaf you're going to make a sa'i. That's the only time that you expose the right arm. Okay, so for example, let's say that you're at the haram, and you're just making tawaf randomly. You're there, you're, you're visiting for, for a week, you do your umrah, you're all done with your umrah, you're just praying. After a prayer, you decide that you want to do an extra tawaf. In that case, you're not going to expose the right arm. The only time you expose the right arm is when you're going to do a sa'i afterwards. So not the nafil tawaf, but we're talking about the tawaf that you do for umrah and after the, after the, um, the, uh, the tawaf of ziyara, which I'll explain later when we talk about hajj. Now, if you forget to expose the right arm, it's fine. Your tawaf will still occur. But this is the sunnah. So let's keep, keep that in mind. All right, now you're facing the Kaaba. The, bl the line for the black stone, the imaginary line, is all the way to your right-hand side, right? It's beyond your right hand. Then you're going to make the niya for tawaf. There are a lot of different types of tawaf. We'll talk about them later. But basically, it depends. If you're making tawaf for umrah, you're going to say, Oh Allah, I intend to make tawaf for umrah, so it, make it easy for me and accept it from me. All right, if you're making a nafal tawaf, just you're making tawaf randomly after any prayer, you're going to say, Ya Allah, I intend to make a nafal tawaf, make it easy for me and accept it from me. So again, depending on the type of tawaf, the niya will vary. All right, so now you've made the niya, you've made itliba, you've exposed your right arm. The next thing you're going to do is now you're going to turn and face the flow of traffic. So you were facing the Kaaba, now you're going to turn and you're going to see people are all walking in this direction. You're also going to turn as if you're walking with the flow of traffic. Then you're going to align yourself so that your left arm is directly in line with the Kaaba. So let's say that that's Hajar Aswad. And actually, this is a perfect example. There's a square there, right? So imagine that that's the Kaaba. Let's say that this is the black stone right here. So I'm going to start out over here. The entire line of the stone, the line made by the stone will be at my right hand side. I'll make ittiba, I'm going to make my niya. Then I'm going to turn myself this way because people are making tawaf, right, in this flow of tawaf, and I'm going to move forward a few steps so that my left hand is in line with the black stone. Now once I do that, I'm facing this way, I'm facing the flow, I'm going to turn my chest and my face towards the black stone. My feet are planted in the direction of the flow, but I'm turning my chest and my face towards the black stone, and then I'm going to do the takbir. So what do I do? I raise my hands to my ears the same way you would for salah. And then you're going to say, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Alhamd. So that's the takbir. Now, once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the takbir, the next thing he did was istilam of the black stone, meaning going and greeting the black stone. So it's sunnah to actually, after you make the takbir, to walk up to the black stone, to place both hands on the black stone and then to put your face on the black stone and kiss it three times right in between your palms. So you've got your two palms against the black stone right on the stone. You put your head in once and you kiss it. You put your head in a second time and you kiss it. And you put your head in a third time and you kiss it. Okay? So that's ideally what you would like to do. But I'll tell you that that's impossible. There's just such a crowd there and people are fighting. Even if you could get your finger on the stone, somebody will have your hand in their face, will have their hand in your face before you can even put it in, because they want their face in there. It's very, very crowded. It's people are, get, are getting angry there. There's a lot of impatience there. It's a difficult place to go. I don't recommend that you even try. Not at the Hajj time. Not at the crowded times. It's too difficult. So basically, what you're going to do instead is, if possible, you'll just touch the stone. And I also don't recommend that because that's too difficult as well. 
If that's not possible, what you're going to do is put both hands in the direction of the stone as if you're imagining that you're touching the stone. So now you have both hands just like this, as if the stone is in front of you, you're touching it, and then you're simply going to take your hands back and kiss them gently, as if you brought the stone to you. And that's basically what most people end up doing, because it's just too much to get anywhere near the stone. Now once you begin, now you're beginning your Umrah. Remember that your, your whole body is facing the direction of flow, right? Your feet are facing the direction of flow. This is all done with the chest and the face turned towards the stone. Now you're going to turn your face back in the direction of flow. And with this, your, your tawaf has begun. Now once the tawaf begins, then the talbiyah, this labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, it ends for the person who's performing Umrah, right? If you're performing Umrah alone, so that means if you're performing just the Umrah in a time outside of the season of Hajj, or if you're performing the Umrah as part of the Tamattu, with that, um, with that final istilam, your Tawaf has begun and your Talbiyah will end. You will no longer say Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. Now, as you circle the uh, Kaaba, you're going to circle it counterclockwise. So imagine that this is the black stone. You're going to go this way counterclockwise. And basically the whole time the Kaaba should be on your left hand side. That's how you know that you're circling it the right way. And you're going to head towards the door of the Kaaba. That's how you know you're moving in the right direction. If you just remember the Kaaba has to always be on my left hand side, it becomes very easy to be able to fulfill this act inshallah. Now remember, what's interesting about the Tawaf is that there is no assigned dhikr in the Tawaf. It's just between the lo the lover and the beloved. You recite whatever you want to recite. You can recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. You can recite Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanallahi al-Azim. You can recite any dhikr that you want. Best to do it in the Arabic language. But any dhikr that you want. And even if you were just silent, your tawaf will still occur. So there is no really assign real assigned dhikr at this point. But let me give you one piece of advice. Go with a plan. You know, if you just sort of get in there and then now you start thinking, okay, what should I recite now? And what should I recite now? What should I recite now? You're not, you're going to be confused and you're not going to take the maximum advantage of the deed. I would think in my mind beforehand, okay, in the first circle, I'm going to recite, Qulu Wallahu Ahad. Then I'm going to recite, Qul Yayul Kafirun or whatever you decide. But in your mind, you should have some plan beforehand that I'm going to get this opportunity to circle the house of my Lord in this state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So what am I going to say to him? You know, if you get an, you know, when people are in love with someone and they think, and they get an opportunity to meet that person, they think beforehand, when I meet them, I'm going to say, I love you and you look like this. And then, you know, this is how people are, right? This is how human beings are made. So think beforehand that I am going to be circling the house of my beloved. So what am I going to say to him as I'm walking? What type of praise is going to emanate from my lips as I'm walking around his house over and over again? So have some sort of plan in your mind. And perhaps that's why nothing is set. This is really an interaction between the lover and the beloved. And each person exposes their love in a different way. Now, as you walk around the Kaaba, you're going to pass one corner, two corners, and you're going to come to the third corner. Obviously, there's four corners. You start at one corner. You're going to pass the second corner. You're going to pass the third corner. Sorry, you're going to pass the second corner. Uh, you're going to, sorry, you're going to pass second and third corner. And you're going to come to the fourth corner. Okay? Right, you're going to come to the fourth corner. That fourth corner is called the Yemeni corner. Rukan Yemani. So it's the, because it faces Yemen. So you can translate it as the Yemeni corner. Basically it's the fourth corner. The one right before the black stone. Now when you come to that corner, you're going to see that there is another exposed stone there. And if possible, what you want to do is you want to touch that stone with your right hand. Or you want to touch that stone with both palms. But if you are distant, you're not going to do anything else. So the only time you do something is if you can touch it. If you can't touch it, you don't do anything else. You'll see a lot of people as they go by, they, they're raising their hands and kissing their hands and saying different things. That's not from the sunnah. The only thing in the sunnah is to touch the stone itself. If you can't touch the stone, you're not going to worry about it. But the one thing that does happen when you pass that stone is that according to hadith, it's sunnah to recite, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa kina adhab al-nar, in between the Yemeni corner and the black stone. 
So between the fourth corner and the restart point, right, the first corner, you're going to recite this special dua, which is actually an ayah. You're going to recite this special dua between that particular face of the Kaaba. So that's the one thing you want to remember. So basically for three, for three faces, you're going to recite anything you want. And then for the fourth face, you're going to always recite this one particular, one particular dua. Now every time you make a circuit, you're going to pass, you're going to pass the black stone. And every time you pass the, pass the black stone, you're going to make istilam again to the black stone. And how are you going to do that? You're going to say, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar walillahi alhamd and kiss your hand. Now you're not going to do the takbir. You don't raise your hand. The takbir is already done and it's only done once. The, the, what you're going to do is just put your hands in the direction of the stone at a, in a low level, say Bismillahi, Allahu Akbar, and then kiss your hand. So that's called istilam. Now you're going to do seven total rounds, okay? And you're going to complete the seventh round with istilam. So now you've done seven istilam. The first round had an istilam and every round thereafter you did an istilam and you're going to complete the seven. Actually, so that makes eight total. Now after the tawaf, the idtiba, the exp exposition of the right shoulder, that ends. All right, so then you're going to re cover back your right, cover up your right shoulder again. Now a couple things that are additional points that I want to mention concerning the tawaf. Number one, for sunnah, it's for, sorry, for men, it's sunnah to perform the first three rounds of tawaf with ramal. Okay, what does ramal mean? Ramal means that you stand erect as if you're a soldier and you move your hands and walk in a little bit of a brisk pace as if you're a shoulder to show, as if you're a soldier to show your strength. So that's called the Ramal, and you'll do that in the first three rounds. Now, if you forget to do it, then you'll do it in the second round. If you forget to do it in the second round, you'll do it in the third round, but you don't make it up. Once the third round is over, if you got it, you got the Sunnah. If you didn't get it, you lost it. All right? So you're going to do that Ramal. Now, people misunderstand the Ramal, and they think that they have to run. So you see people zigging and zagging in, in between people trying to run. You don't have to run, you just have to make the motion, and I'll tell you, you're basically not going to be going very far. Because there's so many people that with every single step, you know, every every minute you probably make 10 or 15 steps. So you're going to make this running soldier-like soldier motion, but you're not going to be really moving very fast. But that's the sunnah for the first three rounds, and believe me, it's tiring. It's really tiring when you're doing this and you're moving at an ant's pace. So it's not an easy thing to do. You think, oh, I'm just going to stand straight and do this. You get very tired doing it. All right. The other thing to remember about the tawaf is that there is a special area which is called the hatim. So you see this little U-shaped brick wall at the edge, on the right-hand edge there of the picture? And that's labeled as hatim. Now, what's interesting about the hatim is that when the Quraysh rebuilt the Kaaba, now you know the famous story of the Quraysh rebuilding the Kaaba after the flood? Remember, they rebuilt the Kaaba and they were debating who should put the black stone down. And then all of a sudden they were arguing with each other and they decided the next person who comes into this room, this area, will give them permission to decide. And the Prophet ﷺ walked in. And so he decided that they would put the stone on a cloth and that all the leaders would hold the, the cloth. And then the Prophet ﷺ himself would pick up the stone and place it in the corner, right? So that's that famous story of the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Now it so happens that when the Quraysh wanted to rebuild the Kaaba, they made an announcement that if we're going to rebuild the Kaaba, we're going to rebuild it with halal wealth. Even they had this concept way back then, despite their ignorance, that it has to be halal wealth that we're going to use to rebuild the Kaaba. Now when they collected the halal wealth from the Quraysh tribe itself, they only had enough money to, to make that structure. They couldn't seal up the rest of the Hatim. So that Hatim used to be inside the Kaaba. But they didn't have enough money, so they left it outside of the actual structure. And that's how the structure remains to this day. Why is that important? Because when you're doing the tawaf, you cannot take a shortcut and cut between that brick wall. Because if you do so, you will not have circled the Kaaba, you will have gone inside and through the Kaaba. Alright, so you have to remain outside of that, of the border of the brick wall. The other thing is that you must be within the masjid. So you can't go outside and just take a car and drive around all the way from outside of the masjid, right? Or just go for a jog outside of the masjid. That's not permissible. You must be inside the masjid. 
But also remember that the Kaaba actually is not a building, it's a whole beam of light that comes from the Arsh of Allah. There's Barakah that is descending and that forms a big pillar. That's an invisible pillar of Tajalliyat and Barakat, we can say. So if you go to the second floor, if you go to the third floor, all of that will still count as having circled the Kaaba. So keep that in mind as well. You can go on the second and third floor and perform your tawaf up there as well. A couple other things to keep in mind is that with every single step that you make, the Kaaba has to remain on your left-hand side. If your body gets turned away from the Kaaba and you deviate and you take, let's say, a side step, right? Instead of walking forward, you take a side step or you're turned backwards and you get pushed backwards, you must go back and retrace your step so that the every step is made with the Kaaba on the left-hand side. Now, if you can't go back, let's say because it's just so crowded, then you lost the round, you won't count that round, and you'll just continue and then restart the round when you get back to the black stone. All right, all seven rounds should be performed together. So you're not going to take three rounds, go for a coffee break, and come back and do four rounds. All right, all seven rounds are performed together. So keep that in mind. Now, sometimes what happens is you're making the rounds and then you get confused. Okay, is this six or is this seven? It's hard to remember. I'm telling you, it's you're just under this very weird state. And there's so much crowd and so it's it, it's getting, you don't even, you're confused about what you should be reading and you're thinking about what to say next and you're being pushed in every direction. You're looking for your group and they're all dispersed throughout the crowd as well. So you get confused about the number of rounds. It happens. So try to keep the best count you can. If you get confused, then you go with a certain number. So if you're sitting on your fifth round and you're not sure, is this my fifth round or is it my fourth round? Just say, forget it. It's my fourth round. Go with the number that you're certain with and then assume it to be the fourth round and just continue. Don't don't entertain this thought for too long. Am I in four? Am I in five? And then you spend the whole time thinking about this as you're circling the Kaaba. Basically, go with the one that you're certain with, establish that as your number, and then start your count. Now, if you do your seven rounds and then you go and do an eighth round, you lock yourself into six more because you have to complete them the second the law. So be careful about going over in the number of rounds. Be a little careful about how you count. All right, once you finish the tawaf, then you're going to cover up your right shoulder. And the next thing that you have to do is that you have to follow up the tawaf with salah at Maqam Ibrahim. Now let's go back to, okay, here's Maqam Ibrahim. So Maqam Ibrahim, I told you, you'll see it's covered by this golden encasement. And it has sort of glass all around it so that you can actually see in and you can see the two footprints of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, at that place... That place happens to be on the mataf. So you have all these people making tawaf and you, your ideal goal is to be able to pray at the maqam Ibrahim. But I'll tell you, it's very difficult. People try. What ends up happening, people step on your head, people step on your neck, people kick you over. You will not be able to pray there without with any degree of comfort. But you'll see people still try to do it. They just you know, put themselves down and plant themselves and decide that they're going to pray there and they don't care what beating they're going to take. They've decided this. But I'll tell you that that's not the advisable way to do it. If it's too crowded, just, you know, you don't have to pray exactly at the Maqam Ibrahim. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to perform it someplace near the Maqam Ibrahim. So what I would recommend is that you actually back off the Maqam and that someplace where it's less crowded, you go ahead and pray. And if you can't do that, you're just going to go ahead and pray any place in the masjid. So basically keep that in mind. Now if it's a makru time or if it's a haram time, then you will not offer the salah. You'll have to wait. The makru times are when? After fajr until the sun rises. After asr until the sun sets. These are the two makru times. The haram times are three. When the sun is actually rising. When the sun is actually setting. And when the sun reaches its peak. So at these five times, you are not going to offer this prayer. You will wait. And then once you pray the farad of the salah, Right. Once the time comes in for the next salah, you'll then connect your prayer with that. It's sunnah to recite kul ya yuhal kafirun in the first rakah and kul hu allahu ahad in the second rakah. All right. So we've talked about that. Now, once you finish the salah at Maqam Ibrahim, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to go to the well of Zamzam. The well of Zamzam uh, is basically a um, is basically on the mataf as well. And there used to be a way to enter it, and I, I think they've changed it, so I don't recall. Uh, uncle, was it? Is it? It's closed now, right? So you can't even you can't even access it. 
right? Okay, okay. So basically they've closed that all off because that was a big block to the tawaf and they've cleared up the area so that people can more easily make tawaf. So what you're going to do then is you're going to go to one of the areas where you can locate Zemzem. They have taps up against certain walls. There's also big um, big vessels, these uh, these coolers, these orange colored coolers that are filled with Zemzem. So you're going to go to some place where you can find Zemzem. Now when you find that Zemzem, what you're going to do is you're going to drink as much as you can. Now, Zamzam is a very special type of water. Literally, in the in the language, the original language, it means plenty or abundant, and it is that well of water that was established when Hajra alayhi salam was running back and forth between Safa and Marwa, trying to find some sort of water for her child. So you know the famous story. Basically, as she was doing that, she began running back and forth seven times until eventually the the well of Zamzam was discovered by her and her child, and then that became a source of water. And obviously that source of water then is, then attracted civilization around it. And so that's really what established Mecca, Mukarramah, as the city, which would then be the backdrop for the coming of the Prophet alayhi salam. So it's a very blessed place. You have to think about this. Actually, the basis for Mecca becoming what it became is the Zamzam. Because if there was no water, nobody would have moved there. It was after the water came that then clans began to, began to come and populate it and animals began to come in. Okay, So that water was essential. It was essential in the establishment of Mecca as a source of the deen, as this birthplace of, of the deen. So it's a very, very blessed well. Now what you're going to do when you get there well, okay, is that you're going to drink as much as possible, you're going to put it on your face, and you're going to make all the intentions that you can concerning it. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in one hadith mentioned that Zamzam is the best water on the face of the earth, and in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that whatever you intend, that's what Zamzam is for. So if you drink it for baraka, it's for baraka. If you drink it for health, it's for health. If you drink it for cure, it's for cure, etc. So you'll make your own individual intention. All right. Now, when you're at the well of Zamzam, or when you're at the tap of Zamzam. You're going to face the direction of the Kaaba and drink as much as possible. Now remember, the same sunnahs apply. You're going to say Bismillah. You're going to drink with your right hand. The only exception is that you're going to stand when you drink Zamzam water. It's sunnah to stand and drink Zamzam water. If possible, you also want to pour it on parts of your body, sprinkle it on your body, etc. There's tremendous barakah in this water. In fact, at that point, you're also going to make um, dua. And I've got all these things because I was supposed to insert the Arabic dua here. But I'll just tell you basically what is the idea in your mind for this dua. The idea in your mind at the well of Zamzam is you're going to say to Allah in your dua, Ya Allah, you established this well, and from this well, you established such abundance of such blessed water that not only was a whole family, not only was a baby's thirst quenched, but a whole family's thirst was quenched, and a whole civilization's thirst became quenched in two ways. Number one, you quench their physical thirst by providing them with water. And number two, you quench their spiritual thirst by providing them with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Ya Allah, in the same way that you spent, you quench their physical thirst and their spiritual thirst in an ever abundant way, in the same way Ya Allah, quench my physical thirst so that I do never become thirsty in this life or in the, in the hereafter, right, which basically avoids you from the hellfire. And Ya Allah, quench my thirst, my spiritual thirst in this life, such that I am always a righteous servant of yours, and that I can emulate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in every deed that I do. So you get the point, right? There's no purpose in memorizing these du'as, because you have to get the gist of the du'a. This is the lover talking to his beloved. In your mind, what's going through, and the historical implications, and the legal implications, you have to put all that together, and with some sort of love, come up with something from the tongue, that attracts the attention of the beloved towards you. That's what it's all about. It's very best blessed place, and it's a place to make abundant du'a with the time when you're drinking from Zamzam. Now, once you've drank Zamzam water, you're going to go back to the Kaaba. And I don't have a picture here because I haven't inserted it yet. But look, basically you're going to go back to the Kaaba, and you see this door. You're going to go and hang yourself from that door. Now, again, I'll tell you, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And so it's probably very unlikely that you're going to get the chance. But what you want to do ideally is hang yourself from that door. You want to cling to the wall of the Kaaba and you want to put your hands up over the door and basically say, Ya Allah, I'm hanging at your door. Now will you forgive me? 
I finally came all the way here. I came to your door begging you to forgive me. So will you now please forgive me? And you're going to put your cheek up against the Kaaba and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you and beg Allah for anything you want. Now I'll tell you, I have heard from many people and from my teachers and from our righteous elders and I can tell you just it is a very, very unique place. It is the one place where the most strange du'as are accepted. I can just tell you that much. I've seen some weird du'as be accepted there. You know, somebody has a brother or a sister and that brother has gone way off the path of the deen and somebody goes up there and makes a du'a for their brother and I've seen their brother change. I've seen their father change. I've seen so many unique things from du'a at the Multazam. So it's an incredible place to make du'a but I'll tell you, unfortunately at Hajj time it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to get on that door. And even if you get on that door, it's likely you'll be torn away in a second because somebody else will want a chance. If you get lucky, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the path in some strange and unique way. Okay, take, grab it and take your chance. But I'll tell you, it's probably too difficult at that point. But what you want to do is when you're actually going for Umrah, let's say sometime you go in October or August, you know, at a time when it's hot and it hasn't, the month of Ramadan has not yet come, that's the time to grab the Muntazam. You can get a good chance at that time. You know, if you can get up there and make that du'a that you want to make. And if there's ever a time in your life, remember this, if there's ever a time in your life that you need something solved and you've tried everything but and you're willing to make one extra step to solve it, go to the multazam. That's the sort of hanging on the throne of Allah, begging Him. And it's very, very r rare that the du'a would be rejected at the multazam. So it's a very, very beautiful place. If it's too crowded... Say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, how can I come anywhere near your door? You have so many servants worshipping you. So I'm standing here far from your door. I don't even have the strength to go to your door. So Ya Allah, I know that you can hear everything and you can see everything. So Allah, I put my hand up here and I'm asking you as if I'm at your door. So will you not answer me and just make your dua? Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it. All right. Now what you're going to do after that is you're going to go back to the black stone probably someplace far away from the black stone, in line with the black stone, and you're going to make one more istinam, sort of the final greeting of the black stone. So now you've done a total of nine, right? You did one at the very end after you made your final circuit, which was the eighth, and then this makes the ninth one, and then with that, you're going to go and perform the sa'i, which means to go between the two mountains of Safa and Marwa. But inshallah, we'll do that in the morning tomorrow. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq, to be able to circle his house the way that a fly circles light, completely finished and just without any thought except the fact that there is light. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to circle the house of our beloved and to do so in a state of love for him. May he give us a tawfiq to be able to regularly drink from the well of Zamzam and to be quenched both physically and spiritually. May he give us a tawfiq to be among those who get the opportunity to beg for forgiveness at the Multazam. And may he give us a tawfiq to be among those who have the opportunity to uh, perform the sa'i so that we can obtain the rewards that were associated with the running back and forth of Hazrat Hajar alayhi salam wa akhirat da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Okay, so it's uh, 10.37. I'll sit back and answer any questions if people have questions before we close this session. Good question. Okay. The water of Zabzab, is that used for everything? Like, meaning even, is, is he also using the washroom and everything? I thought it's only for No, you shouldn't. The water of Zamzam. The question is, can you use the water of Zamzam in the washroom? You should not use it in the washroom. It could be used for drinking. It can be used to make wudu. Um, it could be used for wusul of barakah, etc. But it should not be used to remove najasa. So it's not used in haram in the washroom? Separate That's my understanding that it's not. Then you just touch it once. The istilam is once. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Kiss your hands. You can use zamzam to perform wudu though. Yes, you can make wudu with zamzam. Ramal, actually what happened was is that when the, um, the significance of, the question is about the significance of Ramal. So what happened was is that in the seventh year after the Treaty of Hudaybiya, all of the Quraysh, they exited the city so that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions could perform Umrah. They went on top of a mountain. The leaders of the Quraysh went on top of a mountain called Jabal Abu Qais. 
Now I'll tell you that that Jabal Abu Qais is a very interesting mountain. But it's like almost it's interesting to just know the story of this mountain. Okay, Jabal Abu Qubais or Qubais or Qais. I think it's Qubais. Jabal Abu Qubais is the name of a mountain that's right on the edge of the Haram. Okay, right on the edge of where the Masjid is. So when the that according to some scholars and Hadith is the first mountain that was ever planted on the planet Earth. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uplifted the Kaaba in the flood of Nuh alayhi salam, the black stone was given to the mountain. And the mountain was entrusted with the black stone. So you can think about how medieval this is, you know. It was some kind of magical mountain that took the trust from Allah and hid the black stone away until the Kaaba was to be rebuilt. So that mountain actually held the black stone during that time. Now that mountain also was the highest point in Mecca. So what happened was when the Prophet ﷺ came with his Sahaba to perform the Umrah, the leaders of the Quraysh, they sat on top of that mountain to watch what was going on. And it was a very embarrassing time for them. Because think about it, they had been fighting Islam tooth and nail all the way up until this time. And then all of a sudden now they see that from thousands of people are coming into the Kaaba area saying, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. And you see that all these Muslims are performing their acts of worship, and it was such an embarrassment to them. They really regretted signing that treaty, although the treaty favored them in every way. If you go back to the story of the treaty, it favored them in every way. They really regretted signing that treaty at that day. Now, as a result, they began to insult the Muslims when they were regretting that treaty. So they started saying to themselves, look at these people, they're so weak. You know, they're not even strong in their tawaf. They're so humble and they're putting their head down. And this is not what a man does. This is not the way you make tawaf. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi received word of that, he told his companions that for the first three rounds, show your strength. Put your bodies up straight and show your muscles and show your show your strength. This is the strength of Islam. So for those three rounds, they made the ramal to show the Quraysh their strength. And so that's what it represents. You can make du'a, you can make dhikr, you can make anything you want. But try to do it in Arabic. You know, because that's the language of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's chosen language. So best you speak in that language begging from Him. Yeah. How soon after the Fard prayer do they start du'a? Who starts du'a? Anybody that's there. Oh, right away. Immediately. Yeah, immediately. The whoever's in the front. In fact, people stop their tawaf to pray the Fard prayer. Right? Because they're doing tawaf and the Fard prayer occurs, everybody mm-hmm. stops. Then they start praying, except on the face of the Kaaba where the Imam is, because nobody can be in front of the Imam on that one face. On the other three faces, they can't. So then they stop praying, and then as soon as the Salam is called, they're just up. Start moving. It's a very ajib sign. There a chance when they stop to touch the stone? You have to pray your photo prayer. You're not going to miss the photo prayer to touch the stone. <laughs> but there's guards over there too. They won't let you do that. Yeah. Not walking in front of behind you, they're walking on top of you. <laughs> huh? Well, that's the thing. I mean, they kick you and people just try to remain firm. I'll tell you, you get knocked right over. You will get knocked right over. The people do not care. You can get trampled like that. So, it's an ocean. You just have to back out. Don't try it. People try it, just back out. It's not worth it. It's no, but it's not right. You know, you're going to harm people. You get angry yourself in the prayer. You're not focused on the prayer. This is the time to actually, you know, to, to really get deep in your prayer. So back out and pray. Allah will accept it. That I don't know. It's true that it's true that the angels are also always doing tawaf around that pillar. But beyond that, I can't say anything more. They are getting into spiritual things. Yeah. That beam is there. That beam is there. That 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 the the, the, the actual beam of the Kaaba goes all the way up to the to the heavens. That's that is there. Yeah. I think it's been eroded by touching. Yeah, it's a little bit, but that's also that's the way they have it laid out in the foundation. I I don't know how it was originally to be honest. Um, can you quickly mention? A certain etiquette of making du'a, like instead, like somebody had asked, um, uh, can we make du'a for marriage? 
like, like maybe like the dual, uh, well, let me marry this girl. Okay. As opposed to like if it's for what's best. Right. So the question is about the etiquette of dua. Look, basically, when you make dua, you should make you can make dua, but you should make dua in the manner that the Pope Sallallahu Alaihi made dua. Right. So I mean, that this is not the place to make dua that yeah, Allah, I'm only earning forty five thousand dollars a year and make it fifty. Right. <laughs> If you want to make dua, Ya Allah, put barakah in my wealth. The 45,000 will be 45 million. Okay? It's, there's ways by which you make the dua, and those are taught to us by the Prophet. So what you want to do, see, you know, like I didn't paste in a lot of these duas because honestly, I ran out of time. But on many of the slides, you'll say, I'd say insert reference, insert dua, insert dua etc. The reason why I wanted to insert those duas is not because I want you to memorize them, but because I want you to see them. I want you to see how people make dua and what type of thoughts go through their mind. Because that's how you learn. See, making du'a is a science. You have to learn how to make du'a. Learning du'a is actually a one-year course. So you have to read the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ and learn. Now look, same thing in the Qur'an. How many du'as are re related to us, right? The words of various prophets are related to us. Look at the du'a of Ibrahim salam when he makes the Kaaba and what du'as he makes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrate those du'as so that we recite them till the end of time? Because they were beloved to him. So it means that their manner of making du'a was beloved to Allah. So you learn from that. So that's really the lesson you want to take home concerning the du'as you're going to make in Umrah and Hajj. Is that you want to learn from the du'a of the Akabir. You want to learn from the du'a of the Prophet them, Learn from the du'a of the previous prophets that are present within the Qur'an. That's the gist of it. But one thing, you know, it depends. Everybody's different. Some people have a different state. Like, for example, I'll tell you, some of my teachers, they were afraid to ask for anything. Because, you know, they say, we don't know anything. What are we to ask for? So they would just say, yeah, Allah, whatever is best for me, you give it to me. I don't even know how to properly ask or what I should ask for. And whatever is bad for me, just take it away from me. Some people are more particular, yeah, Allah, let me get married, etc. But, you know, you have to, everybody's different in the way they interact. And you cannot necessarily impose one way on anyone. Again, my recommendation is, pick up the books of dua that exist for Hajj and Umar and read them. They're not transmitted from the Prophet, some of them, alayhi salam. And nobody's claiming that they ever were. You know, some people look at these du'as and they say, Bid'ah, 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 bid'ah. It's not, it's not what that is. Nobody's ever claiming it from the Prophet ﷺ. It's not bid'ah because nobody claims it from him. People are saying that these are some du'as that righteous people have made. So that they teach you the idea of the du'a. Nobody's saying you have to ingrain them in your memory and recite this exact du'a. You'll see people pick up books and then they're just reading these du'as, right? So learn how to make the du'a. That's the point. Okay, that's the take-home message on du'a. For the Umrah. At the time when you enter the Haram, for the Umrah, you're not going to make Tahiyyat al Masjid. You're going to go make Tawaf because that is your Tahiyyat to greet the Kaaba and the Istilam of the stone. But um, as far as other times, you're going to always enter the Masjid and greet the Masjid. That's a separate issue. Okay, we're just talking when you first enter to make the Umrah. Yes. Okay, that's it. Why would the men and women stand next to each other? No, in the in the haram itself, they separate the men and the women. If you happen to be in the street, it gets a little more complicated. But if you're in the haram itself, they do a pretty decent job to do to try to separate them as best as possible. While doing tawaf again, everybody tries to scatter themselves in the best way possible. It's a different world in in that area. You're just in a whole different world, so you can't. It's hard to control those things. There's just no way to do it. There's just too many people. Uh, you said that. Above the Kaaba is a, like a beam of light. Is there anything uh, significant above it in the heavens? That I don't know. That's why he asked that same question. I can't answer that question. Can you, can you make more than once you're not to the, the no, there's no penalty for making an extra istina. You shouldn't because it's against the sunnah. But that's the penalty that we feel bad that we violated the sunnah. But there's no uh, there's no payment. There's no dumb. There's no self -impression. Uh, and everything and like that. Can you, other times, can you go and pray inside the Hatim? Uh, yeah, at any time you can go inside and pray the Hatim. And do you get the reward inside the Hatim? Or? That I'm not sure of. Yes. Just try to find an area. You can always find an area if you're concerned, because most people aren't. Many people aren't. So you can always find an area to block yourself off with a, by a couple people who are just less concerned.
then you just do it and make toba. I mean, there's nothing more you can do. It's just you're out. It's out of your control. But legally, in some cases, your salah would break. But that's a whole separate discussion. I don't want to go into. I don't know. I don't know what that stone represents. Yeah, you can do it with the family, but it's likely you're going to get separated a little bit, so you need to have a plan. The, what, when you're making tawaf and you're with a group of people, rather than say, we have to all stick together, and then you spend your whole tawaf looking for each other, right? Looking, where is he, where is she, is he ahead, is he behind? Just tell everybody, let's try to stay together. And if not, when you're done, let's all meet way back over there. Meeting point. Make a meeting point. Otherwise, I'll tell you what happens when you're doing the tawaf, you're going to be distracted. You're looking, where did she go, where did he go? You're wondering, oh, I think I see her there, I think I see him here. And it's just very distracting. You just want to finish yourself in this, dude. You just, for now, you know? You just... Well, you have to teach them beforehand. Yeah, that's your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about that too. There's, look, every, basically, here's another principle about du'a. Actually, you could do a whole just, I told you, it's a one-year course du'a. Here's another principle of du'a. Is that when you make du'a, you should make du'a in the context in which you are. Okay? So at the multazim, it's different. I'm at your door. It's at the well of zamzam, it's different. I, you know, you, you want to make it in relation. You want to be interactive in what you're doing. So what you're referring to is another interaction, and I'll talk about that when we do the Medina Manawara lecture. Okay? Yeah, I know what you're referring to. I've said that in this couple of speeches before, and we'll talk about it when we get there. Okay, so inshallah with that, we'll close this session.